Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Fred. Um, and I'm so excited to have all of you guys here today. So I wanted to start out with a little agenda today, just so we can kind of break down the presentation as to what we're going to be talking about. Um, so today, we're going to be looking at the how, the why, and the what of the racial disparities in breast cancer mortality. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with the how. Um, so how is breast cancer mortality different for African Americans than whites? And we'll go ahead and start with just some general statistics. I know that some of this might be old hat for you guys, but I just thought I'd do a little brief review. Um, so breast cancer is the most common cancer in women worldwide. Um, it is also the most common cancer in African American women and the second most common cancer in African Americans in general. Um, also kind of the big hitting First big hitting fact of the day, um, African American women are less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer throughout their lifetime. However, they are 40% more likely to die from breast cancer than white women in the United States. So that's kind of the big intro to this whole presentation. Um, this racial disparity leads to an excess of five deaths per day and 1,700 excess deaths per year in the United States. So kind of a big deal, kind of a big issue. Um, as far as some other facts around breast cancer in general, um, very prevalent again among all races in the United States and worldwide, um, with over 30,000 expected new cases in 2016 in the U.S. alone. Um, however, incidence and prevalence rates are higher than any other race for women under 45 for African Americans. Um, Premenopausal African American women were also twice as likely to develop triple negative breast cancer tumors. And I'll go into what that means in a little bit more detail later, but it's a much more aggressive um, and high risk form of breast cancer. Um, mortality rates for African Americans have gone from 30% higher than white patients to 42% higher within the last two decades. So that's it's, it's, the issue is definitely in, continuing to increase and continuing to be an issue. And then 75% of this disparity, according to the research, can be attributed to socioeconomic and clinical factors, leaving only 25% to be attributed to African American race and other biological factors. So we'll kind of be going into that within the next few minutes. To kind of bring it a little bit more local into Marion County, um, how could this affect Marion County? Um, as far as our African American population, um, the total uh, African American population in Marion County is 26.37%. Um, that is a huge increase compared to the statewide uh, population as well as nationwide. Um, and then again, in Marion County, African American females are 42% more likely to die of breast cancer, so higher than the state average and national average. Um, so definitely relevant to us in our community. Um, not entirely surprising uh, that this is an issue in Marion County. This is an overall map of health outcomes in general, not just related to cancer, of all the different counties throughout the state. Um, and as you can see, Marion County having that darker shade um, has one of the poorest overall health outcomes throughout the state. Um, so I wanted to use this tool um, to kind of show a little bit more in depth about our, uh, our county and what are some of the top hitting um, socioeconomic factors that were related to this racial disparity in breast cancer mortality um, for African Americans. Um, this just kind of shows which areas um, have the highest African American population within Marion County. So these dark areas have anywhere from 40% to 73.5% um, of an African American population. Um, and then these other boxes here, now these are not specific to the African American population, but again, these are the four other top socioeconomic factors that were related to this disparity throughout the research. And this kind of shows where these uh, hot spots are throughout our community. So starting with um, percent of adults living uh, below the poverty line, so those dark areas over there show up to 38% of the adult population living under the poverty line. Um, Individuals under 65 years of age having uh, no health insurance. Um, individuals that are uh, over 25 years old without a high school diploma. Um, so those areas show up to 33.7%. And then individuals over 16 years old that are unemployed. Um, and those areas show up to 14% of that population. So you can kind of see from this where those areas overlap with um, our um, different zip code areas with the highest African American population. So you can kind of see where the hotspots are for this issue according to the research. So now that we've kind of gone over the how, how is it different, what are the facts, uh, we'll go into why. Why is this? 
Uh, we'll start with a concept called the amenability index. Now, this was something that was mentioned in several studies that I looked at. And what the amenability index said, now it's not strictly related to cancer or breast cancer, um, what it means is that the more preventable and treatable the condition, the more likely there is to be a racial disparity. Um, and this graph here, which I got from uh, the Susan G. Komen website, um, this shows both the incidence rate, so the number of new breast cancer, uh, breast cancer cases, and the mortality rate, so the number of fatalities or the number of individuals that die from breast cancer. Um, on a, and, and I apologize, it only goes till 2004, but I can, I can assure you that the trend continues in this way. Um, you can see that leading up to 1980, where this little green line is, um, the incidence rates in white patients and African American patients has stayed the same. The incidence is higher for white patients. However, once we get to 1980, the mortality rates seem to switch. That is kind of the, the magic moment where although more white patients are being diagnosed with breast cancer, more African American patients are dying of breast cancer. And why is that? In the research, um, it attributes this to increases or new developments in treatment and um, detection. So as soon as these new technologies became available, due to several socioeconomic reasons, more white patients were able to access these tools and these treatments, um, which is what sort of caused caused this whole issue to start. So the amenability index was very prevalent, as I said, in the research that I looked over and something that we'll go back to throughout the presentation. Um, so kind of going back to that fact that 25% of this uh, racial disparity could be attributed to African uh, ancestry and breast cancer. So the amenability index kind of accounts for that 75% in many ways. This 25%, I did want to include some information that was related to that um, in the research that I reviewed. So some of those things, um, African American women had a much higher risk for triple negative breast cancer. Um, and what that means, like I said, it's a more aggressive, um, high risk form of breast cancer. And that's because due to certain um, hormone receptors, that those cancer cells are less receptive to some of the most common therapies that we offer for breast cancer. So oftentimes those types of breast cancer are much less receptive or sometimes even non-receptive uh, non to some of the most common therapies and treatments. So that presents a huge problem. Um, also, this same type, the uh, triple negative breast cancer, was more prevalent in low income and uninsured populations. So we already know that those have kind of coincided with this issue with uh, racial disparities, so that's also an interesting issue. Um, there was one study also, I didn't find many, but one in Florida um, strictly on African American breast cancer patients that showed that that population had a higher risk for the um, BRCA1 gene, um, which is a good predictor for having breast cancer at an earlier age. So that was interesting. Um, but overall, as far as linking this racial disparity to African ancestry and other biological factors, we really don't have enough international research on African populations to really make a lot of linkages or connections between this. So overall, we need more information. So as far as going back to that 75% that can be attributed to factors related to the amenability index, um, the National Cancer Institute offers a framework for describing racial disparities in cancer. And I'm going to use that framework to go ahead and kind of structure the rest of the presentation. Um, so the National Cancer Institute says that this dis these disparities can be broken down into three different types of barriers, including institutional barriers, clinical and provider-centered barriers, and patient-centered barriers. So we're going to go through those. So some examples of institutional barriers include health insurance status, available healthcare institutions, and geographic region. These were three of the most, the ones that related most to this issue. So I'm going to go through those a little bit. Um, so as far as health insurance status, uh, on a national level, 21% of African Americans are uninsured compared to 13% of white Americans. Um, in 2014, 18% of non-elderly adult African American Hoosiers were utilizing Medicaid, and 12% were uninsured. Now, these numbers may have changed with the expansion of HIP 2.0. This is unfortunately the most recent uh, statistic I could find, 
So why is this important? Um, in the research related to this disparity, um, Medicaid, usage, Medicaid uh, utilization was linked to reduce screening rates and reduce treatment adherence. Um, so that's a big one. Um, insured and underinsured are at greater risk for more aggressive cancers. And really the bigger, the bigger note was late stage diagnosis. Um, those that are uninsured or are utilizing Medicaid or other publicly funded uh, insurance they are. They do not have as high of uh, screening rates. Then again, leading to later stage diagnosis, not being diagnosed until they have a more advanced tumor biology and more difficult to treat. So that is definitely an issue. And then Medicaid coverage uh, during the year prior to diagnosis did detect for or did predict earlier detection. So um, making sure even if they even if they are using using a publicly funded insurance, being covered by Medicaid can help increase that. So. Really working with those uninsured populations is important as well. So available healthcare institutions, there was some interesting information about that. Um, one study in particular, um, done re very recently in 2015, looked at several uh, facilities that treat mainly minority patients versus those that treat mainly non-minority patients. Um, within that study, they found that although ch that only 27% of those facilities that treat mostly minority patients had an academic affiliation and were more likely to use evidence-based practice, um, as opposed to 71% of the non minority facilities. And then um, only 18% of those institutions that treated mainly minorities offered digital mammography, which is the most up-to-date, um, most advanced form of uh, mammography, opposed to 71% of the non-minority facilities. So that's a big one. Um, Often Medicaid and having an insurance status also played into that as well. Um, there was studies that found that Medicaid patients may have a harder, harder time finding doctors and institutions that will take them on as a patient. Um, and that proved to be an issue within several studies I read uh, on this racial disparity. So geographic region, this was, a, this was another really big one. Um, proximity to the nearest mammography facility was associated with having racial disparities or a larger racial disparity in screening rates and overall mortality rates. So this really relates back to the amenability index, saying that the more preventable or treatable or the more available those resources are, the, lar the greater chance there's going to be a racial disparity. That holds very true uh, as it relates to geographic region. Um, urban communities with cluster mammography facilities, so the more access people have, the more likely there was to be a wider gap. Um, so that was definitely, there were several studies that looked at that and related uh, both, again, screening rates and overall mortality rates to proximity to mammography services and treatment centers. So moving on to patient-centered barriers. Um, some of the patient-centered barriers that were most relevant to this topic were socioeconomic status, a lot of subtopics involved in that, um, cultural attitudes and religious beliefs, and social support. So we'll start with socioeconomic status. Um, I included this quote at the top um, in one study done in 2014 on African-American breast cancer patients. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the most common responses or um, in a qualitative study that they had done was cancer's least of my worries, meaning that they had so many other things that were going on in their life um, attributed to being either low income or underinsured or um, unemployed that having breast cancer and getting, uh, being up to date with their mammograms and having treatment adherence was not really on the radar as much as it would be for someone that was not in that situation. Um, also, breast cancer patients, now these, these are not strictly related to African Americans, these next statistics. However, again, we know that in the research, these, um, these topics have overlapped quite a bit, or these risk factors have overlapped. Um, so they did find that breast cancer patients um, with lower education have more difficulty understanding and communicating with providers, leading to lower participation in treatment. Um, how could that affect Marion County? 43.81% um, of Marion County adults over age 25 have a high school diploma or less. So even regardless of race, that could present a huge issue within our community. Um, but these two topics did overlap quite a bit for our African-American patients. Um, poverty and education level were related directly to a higher risk of ER negative cancer, which is a certain form that's included under that tri triple negative breast cancer, just makes them less receptive to some of our most common therapies. 
Um, oh, sorry, I'll go back one second. Um, and then lower uh, socioeconomic status, income level, race, and place of residence, kind of what we talked about before, all were predictors of a higher stage at diagnosis and poorer survival. So again, we kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, and how does income level really affect Marion County? Again, not specific to African Americans. However, 57.78% of Marion County adults are living beneath the poverty line. Um, so, and that kind of gives you just a little reminder as to what that looks like. So, both are huge issues within our community and ones that we definitely cannot overlook when looking at this topic. Um, this map uh, shows overall socioeconomic status index. Um, and as you can see, those with the lighter shade in the middle um, have the lowest SES level um, within our population. So you can kind of see where, again, where these issues overlap, where are the hot spots. Definitely a prevalent issue for Marion County. Social support. Um, so numerous studies reported uh, not only that African Americans um, have less domestic support and overall social support as, at, at time of diagnosis, but kind of to help them through this process. Um, I will touch a little bit more on this in uh, when we talk about religious beliefs and faith. Um, Due to this, uh, there was a study that came out that said 70% of African American women report feeling uncomfortable discussing their diagnosis with others. So that could be a leading factor. There's a lot of, um, a lot of the research talked about an, an underlying stigma around breast cancer and cancer in general among African American women that may make them less comfortable with discussing this with their spouse, with their community. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, also, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about provider relations, but African Americans were less likely to bring a companion to their provider visits, which overall does lead to less question asking um, during the visit, less clinical decision making by the patient or you know, in, a, in conjunction with their doctor, um, and overall less information gained from that visit. So having that social support and having someone in their life that they can feel comfortable sharing this issue with is important. Um, however, it does present a huge issue at the current time. So faith and religious beliefs. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, topics underneath this whole project. It was really interesting to read about. Um, culture, or I'm sorry, faith, and that plays a huge part in African American women's journey through breast cancer, any cancer in general, um, but specifically breast cancer. Um, so religious participation is linked to improved quality of life, health status, and reduced mortality risk for African Americans. Um, so in many ways, this can be a protective factor for this population. However, there are some ways where it can act somewhat as a barrier. Um, however, I did want to include this uh, quote as well. Um, this was such a hot topic under breast cancer mortality in African American females that even one study released its own definition of African American spirituality. Um, and I won't go through the whole thing, but it's a very distinct, very powerful force within this whole process, one that definitely cannot be overlooked. Um, African American patients with breast cancer claimed that God helped them with healing their cancer, preventing cancer from spreading, finding the right position, even choosing the right treatment. Um, there were reports that even some patients will pray and wait for a sign to determine what their next move is. So again, very supportive and really brings a lot of comfort. Um, however, um, sometimes this can kind of come into play with the current therapies and treatments that are available, um, even support groups and complex complementary therapies. Um, many support groups and group therapies that did not include spirituality and faith were considered to be culturally incompetent by this population. So they're much less likely to participate and gain the benefits of that. Um, also fatalism was a huge issue that was talked about within the research. Um, fatalism is the idea that there is a higher power that's contro in control of um, what's going to happen next, in control of their fate, in control of uh, whether this cancer is going to keep going or they're going to find the right treatment or what the answer is. Um, and again, kind of a mixed bag, can be a protective factor and can also be a barrier. So kind of moving on to clinical and provider-centered barriers. Um, Again, other really interesting topics. Um, some of those include patient and provider relations or doctor relations, um, risk measurement tools, and then treatment patterns. 
So patient and provider relations, um, and providers, um, you know, really we're talking about doctors where we want to include all the clinical entities that might be involved in that clinical visit um, at that time. Um, so 75% of medical visits are racially discordant, meaning the race of the physician and the race of the patient are different. Um, and 75% of these medical visits are racially discordant for, specifically for African American patients, not for white patients. So that's huge. Um, I think the percentage of uh, racially discordant medical visits for white patients is somewhere in the 20s. I think it's like 25%. So that's big. Um, and the presence of inherent racism and racial bias, unfortunately, is brought in, according to the research, is brought in by both parties to these uh, clinical visits a lot of times. And it does affect the communication and it does affect the information that's shared in these visits. Um, convergence um, is the understanding, is the agreement and understanding by both the patient and the physician as to what was talked about and what knowledge was gained. Um, and that is experienced much less in racially discordant visits, um, especially among older patients and patients with lower education level. Um, overall, these visits have been reported to be less positive and productive, shorter in length, um, and overall include less decision making and less relationship building from the patient with the provider. Um, again, this is not all one-sided. It's um, definitely a two-way street. Um, however, according to the research, um, we really need uh, we really need some attention to be paid to these certain these type of medical visits. Um, Mostly because even less question asking and decision making has been led to patient distrust. Some of the issues, some of the research out there showed that even after one patient visit, the level of patient distrust was skyrocket after even just one interaction, which can be related to lower treatment adherence, lower screenings, and things like that. It can definitely affect the decisions that are made. Risk measurement tools. Um, so we have found that there are specific risk factors that affect African American women's risk for breast cancer that may not be present within uh, white patients. Some of these included things like obesity, parity, or number of children um, that that patient has had, um, use of oral contraceptives, and family history. Um, so unfortunately, even though we have kind of uh, realized over the past few years that these are present for this population, it took us a while to catch up on our risk assessment tools. Um, there was one, the, the most common uh, risk assessment tool, uh, the Gale model, is used to predict whether an individual is at high risk for breast cancer, and this is used in many preventative trials. Um, so one study, the Black Women's Health Study, um, took one population that was assessed by the Gale model originally, um, and the Gale model originally identified 3% of that population as being high risk for breast cancer, of the African American population to be at high risk for breast cancer. When that tool was recalibrated to include some of the information that we now know about the differences in breast cancer risk between these races, um, that new recalibrated tool found that 14.6% of that same population were actually at high risk for breast cancer and eligible to participate in preventative trials. Um, so that's huge. Um, unfortunately, at least from, from what we have been able to see or what I was able to find on the websites that uh, list the Gale model, we have not fully updated that. It's not in wide use um, within the medical community, but I know that that will be coming soon. And it's definitely something that uh, has affected our overall risk measurement. Um, so treatment patterns. There were a couple different topics under here. Um, side effects of treatment were discussed in only about 62% of provider visits with African American patients compared with 97% of white patients. So if questions aren't being asked and answers aren't being given about treatments, you can imagine it's much less likely that a patient is going to adhere to that sort of treatment or choose. It's going to affect their treatment options and their decisions. Um, also with treatments, African American patients are much less likely to be recommended for clinical trials and more likely to be prescribed a non-traditional form of chemotherapy. Um, so clinical trials can sometimes be the preferred method of, uh, of treatment. And unfortunately, this population is recommended for these trials uh, at a much lower rate. Um, Overall, when it comes to treatments, with the research that I saw, African-American patients were much less likely to participate in recommended surgical therapies, radiation, and chemotherapy. Um, and those that did participate in, uh, participate in these treatment options um, often reported to receive lower quality services in these areas. 
So treatment is a huge issue. Um, also, the concept of underdosing. Now, not a lot of the research explained why this happens. I did have someone ask. Um, however, underdosing was a topic that was very prevalent in the information that I looked at. And what that means is that that individual was given um, was given a dosage of treatment that is proven to be less effective or non-effective at actually reducing the rate of cancer recurrence or reducing the current um, the current tumors. Um, so unfortunately, underdosing affects 39% of African American patients and only 28% of white patients. Um, I think that this probably is related mostly back to our risk measurement tools. Um, we we're still kind of getting up to speed with how to predict which uh, which members or which patients of African American patients are really at high risk, and that has to affect what percentage of treatment or what dosage. Uh, we're administering to these patients. So I think that those two are probably very related, um, and the research that I looked at did support that as well. So it's all intertwined. Um, however, those were the key topics with treatment patterns. So overall, late stage detection is a huge issue as well. The last topic uh, that I'll talk about under those risk factors, um, and this is due to several things, um, including conflicting recommendations around mammography screenings and the age um, that we should be getting those, improper risk measurement tools, um, limited access to proper mammography services, so digital mam mammography being less available in some of the institutions that serve mainly minorities, um, and then the fatalism and distrust of the healthcare system, so again, kind of uh, only spiritual or uh, personal beliefs kind of coming into those interactions um, and then the issue of insurance all of these factors play into this issue of late stage detection this population is getting uh, screened later in the process and ultimately these cancers are not detected until they have a more advanced tumor biology and are at a higher stage and overall harder to treat um, I wanted to include this as well. This is overall um, mammography screenings for Marion County. Um, although you might look and say, oh, they're, they're kind of similar. We are still uh, below the state average and below the national average. Um, so we still have some improvement. So where do we intervene? What do we do? After we just threw all that information at you, <laughs> what can we do? Um, so I wanted to start out with a couple of topics that really stuck out in the research. Um, the first is mental health and stress reduction. So why is this important? How does that play into breast cancer? Um, so having low rates of social and emotional support at diagnosis predict higher mortality risk over a 10-year period, specifically within the African-American population. Um, African-Americans had poor mental health and quality of life scores than white patients. Um, so that's a huge deal. Um, also, physical e exercise interventions have proven to be very successful at targeting this issue. Overall, well, improving well-being and reducing anxiety and stress. Um, I'll introduce the concept of complementary medicine. I know this is not a new concept for many of you. Um, complementary medicine are psych uh, psychosocial interventions and programs used alongside clinical treatment. So these have been particularly helpful with addressing this issue of mental health and stress reduction. And those include physical exercise interventions. Um, one that was popped up several times within the research is yoga interventions. So yoga has been, as just an example, um, has been proven to decrease psychosocial symptoms and distress. Everything from improving mood, decreasing anxiety, increasing wound healing and wound care, all the way to reducing the intensity and frequency of chemotherapy-induced vomiting. So even um, something that you know some of us might do every day, um, these uh, tailored to complementary medicine interventions have really been proved to be helpful. Um, one particular study, the CARE study that was done very recently in 2014, used another type of complementary therapy. It uses cognitive behavioral stress management as a culturally appropriate framework for addressing this issue within this population. Um, the CARE study used uh, solely African-American breast cancer patients um, in their study. And this study had a 95% retention rate, which is great. Um, and it, uh, yielded improvements in psychosocial adaptation to cancer survivorship, including quality of life, perceived stress, um, depressive symptoms, and intrusive thoughts. So this was another really great example uh, that was very evident in the literature, and one that was kind of stuck out because it used solely African-American patients and had such a high retention rate. So that was awesome. <laughs> 
Obesity and weight management. I did want to touch on this because there is a lot of, we usually get a lot of questions about um, obesity and breast cancer in African Americans. So um, just to kind of add a little bit of context, um, African American Hoosiers are 11.4% more likely to be obese than white Hoosiers. Um, however, some of the research that I found is kind of conflicting over uh, what the, uh, what a lot of questions we get about obesity and breast cancer. So um, having a BMI of over 35 does predict worse disease-free survival independent of race and treatment. So it is a factor. Um, over half of all breast cancer patients are obese at the time of diagnosis, um, regardless of race. However, as far as obesity is related to African-American breast cancer, um, the research supported that it may be less related to central obesity and more related to some of the comorbidities that are associated with with obesity, um, such as diabetes, heart disease, things like that, and particularly for cancer survivors. Um, and again, greater risk for postmenopausal patients. Um, so not really necessarily related to that. All of the interventions that I've found that were related to obesity with breast cancer patients were really aimed at survivorship and avoiding things like diabetes and heart disease and things, um, other conditions like that in uh, survivorship as that can sometimes um, decrease overall survivorship and increase the likelihood that that cancer might return. Um, so really focused on that. Um, there were some studies, uh, one study done in Nigeria and one in North Carolina that found not BMI but waist to hip ratio to be a risk factor for all ages. So maybe less focused on obesity and more on um, that issue or maybe just different forms of measurement. Um, and then again, interventions aimed at uh, diet and increasing exercise were aimed at survivors. Community-based education on racial disparities. Um, so this was a big one as far as applications of all of this. Um, many African Americans may not be aware of the severity and the impact of racial disparities in breast cancer. They might feel like they might be uh, more affected by these issues, but they might not understand, you know, the the severe impact. Um, so one of the uh, one of the tools that was suggested was community-based education. The community setting was oh I'm sorry community setting was identified as the ideal opportunity for educating people about this issue for several reasons. Um, you know health is local. You can't you cannot um, addressing this at an individual level is not going to solve the problem. Um, so in the community setting, you're able to identify and address several health problems that are occurring within the community. Um, really understanding and attending to the sociocultural aspects of that community and of the racial biases that might be present. Um, and then you also have the opportunity to coordinate local resources, similar to what we're doing today, bringing the community together, bringing experts together um, to really address these issues as a group. Um, this is uh, the Society of General, General Internal Medicine's uh, released guidelines for teaching about racial disparities. So, there's definitely a platform that's already been set that uh, we can build upon to address this topic. And just three general guidelines, again, just making sure that the community understands what racial bias and what racial, uh, racial or disparities are, are there within their community. Um, knowing why they're there and what the causes are and then knowing how to effectively address these issues. What can they be doing? What can they be doing for their community, for their families? Provider-based education. So this extends beyond the community, um, and there was quite a bit of information out there about offering education on racial disparities to the provider community. Um, education to, on racial disparities should be extended to the medical and public health community members. Um, the Institute of Medicine recommends training for providers in racial disparities, again, to help them better serve their communities and better serve their patients. Um, this also, this topic also brought up the issue of perhaps encouraging more racial diversity in the medical community. Um, those provider uh, provider relation facts that we shared earlier about um, the the communication issues and racially discordant uh, medical visits, again, those are not present in racially concordant visits. As I mean, I'm sure they are, but not as prevalent. Um, so encouraging more racial diversity and getting um, individuals of different races more involved in this education in the provider field in general could also be a protective factor for this population. Um, just as a last example, um, a study done in Chicago last year in 2015, again Chicago has one of the largest um, urban African American communities in the United States, um, 
a study within 86 low-income African-American communities within Chicago, 94% um, of those participants agreed that community members should be involved in the curriculum development for this process, for providers and for the community. So obviously this population has a huge interest in contributing to that, which can uh, include invaluable information and experience that can only be used to help uh, treating this community. So what can we do to help? Um, now that we know all the information that's good to know about this issue, what can we do? Um, just a little bit on Little Red Door Cancer Agency and kind of what we've been doing to help with this disparity and just a little background information. Um, as far as health promotion and cancer prevention, um, last year we reached out to almost 31,000 Hoosiers um, about this issue, um, offering um, $1,520,000 in client services and reaching thousands of patients with complimentary patients and uh, caretakers, survivors with complimentary therapies, transportation services, prevention education, um, and including other complimentary therapies and just um, opportunities for patients that are going through this experience to interact with each other on a positive, uh, positive note in a non-clinical environment, such as walking club, cooking club, um, gardening club, things like that. So despite all these things, um, within, we wanted to take it a step further. Um, within the Little Red Door Cancer Agency's 2015 annual report, one of our goals was to develop a wraparound program for African American women with breast cancer to decrease this disparity. So some of the suggestions that I drew from the research that I, uh, that I looked at for this project um, that could be applied not only for Little Red Door, but for every um, organization within the community that's dedicated to addressing this issue. Um, these were some of the top, uh, top hitting suggestions that kind of came through through all that information. Um, community empowerment or a prescription for change. In that study done in 2015 in Chicago, um, those community members agreed to create a community-based education program and what they called it was a prescription for change. And um, community members and the African American population uh, going through this breast cancer journey were very involved in the development of that curriculum. Um, overall leading to more empowerment and a greater sense of um, belonging. Um, it really encouraged more participation within that whole process um, and really bringing the community together. Targeted geographic outreach. As you can see, there are definitely certain areas of Marion County and I'm sure of the um, surrounding counties as well where this might be more of an issue than others. Um, so maybe targeting, targeting outreach to those areas and making sure that resources are available and the community is aware of them could be um, a helpful, helpful strategy. Um, Faith-based partnerships. As you saw, most of the research around this topic had stated that not including faith in the interventions for this group is ultimately going to lead to a culturally incompetent um, prevention uh, prevention tool. So definitely including faith-based partnerships um, within addressing this is something that can't be overlooked. Um, and then a storyteller program. There were several studies, again, that showed that there is definitely a desire um, for the community that is faced with this issue to participate and to share their stories and to share their experience and their breast cancer journey and help not only others within their own community understand what's going on and understand the severity and the impact of racial disparities in breast cancer mortality, but help uh, those outside of the community understand. Um, so development of this could be um, very successful within our community as it was in Chicago. So with that, I want to thank you guys all for listening today. Um, hopefully not all of this was old hat for you and maybe it can add a little bit of extra context or reinforcement to the efforts I know all of you are doing to address this issue in Marion County.